Okay. So uh, thank you very much for introduction. And uh, again, it's me. <laughs> so we need to talk about uh, myeloma, especially uh, with respect to the access barriers. And uh, as in the introduction, it was said, uh, myeloma has become from a very simple and very cheap disease to become a very, very complicated and unfortunately very expensively treated disease. Uh, I was told that in Austria, which is not far from Hungary, uh, where uh, in hematological centers maybe 10% of all patients have myeloma and 90% of the patients have something else uh, of hematological nature, the uh, budget need for myeloma is approximately two-thirds of all the money spent on hematology is spent on myeloma that represents 10% of all hematological patients. So this is really a problem, and uh, this is a problem in uh, the rich part of the world, and it's much more of a problem in uh, the somewhat less advanced part of uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, my experience uh, is especially pertaining to Hungary, but I think uh, especially in Poland is in similar situation. Czech Republic and Slovakia is maybe a little bit better, but uh, many of the uh, problems are shared. So I will provide most information about the Hungarian situation and we see how much that is applicable to your home country. So uh, what are the most important access barriers? Uh, I listed some of the access barriers uh, which we do experience in Hungary. For instance, we have uh, for the treat of myeloma need for off-label therapy. So uh, in Europe, uh, this is an important uh, problem, which is much less of a problem in the US. In the US, uh, the label is one thing, and then the doctors can use a lot of that off label. Uh, in uh, European countries, the label is strict, and you cannot use a drug off label. And in Hungary, normally, insurance companies do not finance off label use of drug, even though it may be allowed, but maybe financing is less forthcoming. Sometimes and frequently there is a need for non-finance therapy, which is on label, but there is no money in the budget. So that's also a big problem, especially this is the situation with new drugs. So the drugs are EME uh, registered, so legal to use, but may not be used because the country cannot provide sufficient funds. And uh, more, more and more, uh, this is uh, a problem that uh, some uh, health coverage may be supplemented by other insurance. Uh, at least uh, a few patients in Hungary have supplemental health coverage, uh, but uh, that seems to be insufficient for cancer care. So this is also a problem that the government doesn't pay and the supplemental health insurance doesn't pay. And uh, access barrier is the presence of waiting lists. I don't know in your country, but in Hungary we have waiting lists for transplantation and some patients do progress while on the waiting list. So this is a problem that we cannot transplant patients when we want to do that because we have uh, insufficient access to the transplant unit. So a couple of months a patient has to be on a waiting list. Normally, medically, we know that uh, after stem cell collection, it is best to wait approximately one month and then do the transplantation. That's optimal. But uh, normally it takes three, four times that much in Hungary to have the transplantation done. And uh, in Hungary, uh, I don't know about your country, but we have a lot of individual applications. So, uh, the doctor decides what would be the optimal therapy, which is not normally covered by the insurance, but we have a system of the individual advanced claim. So we send in a letter with all the results of the patient and we argue that this would be an appropriate therapy for the patient. And usually after one or two months, we do receive a response whether it will be funded or not and under what situation. So this is a very important access barrier because sometimes the patient passes away before we get a response. And the response may not be affirmative. So it may be declined. 
Okay, let's go for first time therapy. That's easy. It made easy you to generate bortezomib. Because uh, in most European countries, bortezomib patent has expired. And uh, in Hungary, uh, the price of uh, bortezomib dropped by 90%. So it become a really cheap drug. So it's a cheap drug, so it's no problem anymore to use it. So previously it was uh, somewhat hindered, but uh, we have reached a point that bortezomib is one of the cheapest drugs to use in multiple myeloma, and uh, the access is easy. So we do know that uh, induction regimen for eligible, uh, transplant eligible patient, uh, as has been shown by Dr. Zwigman, uh, could be bortezomib combined with cyclophosphamide or dexamethasone or thalidomide dexamethasone, and maybe in certain situations, especially in the case of extramedullary disease, it could be uh, anticyclines, like per the British protocol. And uh, in some situations, when the patient refuses to have parenteral therapy, you can use uh, cyclophosphamide, thalidomide, and dexamethasone, and that is also available, because now Sergin offers thalidomide really cheap in Hungary. Previously, we had to buy the drug from India, but now uh, we can have a legal thalidomide uh, in Hungary, and it is done cheap. So uh, we have good options, and uh, I think uh, there is no uh, excess barrier because of the generic program. And uh, stem cell mobilization is usually, again, without problem, and uh, uh, the process itself is going well, we have a problem of the long-term storage of stem cells, the so-called tank problem. I mean, these tanks in which the uh, stem cells are sitting in liquid nitrogen, uh, these have some cost, and the resupply of liquid nitrogen is expensive, especially if you start to think that you want to store these stem cells to five to 10 years, maybe longer. So this is taking up a lot of space in the lab, and then you need a new room, and so on and so on. So there is a real access barrier here. So really, we have to consider that as a problem to be solved. With respect to autologous stem cell transplantation, as I told in my introductory slide, there is a waiting list. And probably that's a situation in many countries. Uh, the waiting list is uh, OK if you, have, if you are waiting for uh, hip replacement because it is painful, but uh, you do not get some more, more or less damage uh, if it's delayed by half a year. But if uh, you are waiting for transplantation, and if you wait a half a year, then your disease may relapse, and then you have uh, a problem, because you have to, have, uh, to apply a second-line therapy with all these toxicities. And at least in Hungary, the waiting list is disfavoring myeloma patients. This is a... Uh, uh, reason that uh, lymphoma patients are preferred because for lymphoma patients, uh, uh, the, if they relapse on the waiting list, there are fewer options to salvage. And they say that for myeloma, you have a lot of options to salvage, so it's less a problem if on the waiting list. So myeloma patients have a disfavor on the waiting list. So it's not every patient taken identically. I mean, there is a medical reason for that, which is acceptable, but not nice. As we discussed before, uh, that sometimes melphalan has an excess problem, and uh, uh, it is uh, a problem because we do need to become hamsters and stock for winter. <laughs> so we have to buy a lot more when it's available on the market than our actual use, and we have to store the drug because we may expect that maybe three months from now, we will have no drug. So this is a problem because it takes a lot of money from the hospital uh, to buy the drug and stock it, and uh, some drug may expire by stocking, then it becomes a total loss, so it's a problem. And sometimes you have to buy the drug from outside European Union. We do it from Argentina when uh, we have uh, the need for the drug, and on the European market it is not available, and I heard that some other countries buy from India. So, I mean, this is a problem, and this is a pharmaceutical industry problem, not only melphalan, but the uh, same problem may exist for methotrexate, which is a really important lymphoma and acute leukemia drug, and sometimes uh, there is none 
available on the European market. And the same may happen with 5 fluoro uracil, which is an important drug for uh, colon cancer. And as far as I know, there is only a single company in the world who makes it, like an Israeli company, and sometimes they shut down and there is no drug. So th this is a consequence of the generic program, that the, com the price of the drug goes so low that uh, all of the companies stop producing it. So uh, this is a problem. This is a problem and this is not something to be solved quite easily. So, and then consolidation and maintenance, I, that I made uh, such a large suggestion about its importance in my prior lecture. So we have a uh, long-term financing problem. It's really the problem that its own label, lenalidomide, uh, could be used, but at least in Hungary, uh, at this point, we have no option to get it because uh, it would take so much money over so many years that uh, it would uh, tear apart the cancer budget and uh, they don't even negotiate about that because it's, it takes so much effort and everyone is expecting maybe lenalidomide patent to expire in a couple of years and then excess problem will solve by itself. And there is an off-label problem because uh, some of the drugs that may be used for maintenance are not registered for maintenance. And this is especially true about consolidation therapy because in the patients who we do not reach complete remission, we would like to use maybe VTD again, like same for induction or consolidation. But for consolidation, this therapy is not registered and since it's not registered, it's not financed. So it's a problem, and uh, this, uh, we have not uh, figured out a good solution. And we have a problem for access to minimal residual disease monitoring, because it needs a special center uh, who has a good flow cytometry laboratory, and uh, very few patients have access to such a center because uh, of travel and uh, other problems. So MRD monitoring is mainly done in uh, patient uh, care centers that are associated with universities, uh, or maybe our hospital as well, but uh, many of the countryside centers do not have access to MRD monitoring, uh, mainly of logistic and financial reasons. Okay. So the problems are many uh, with respect uh, to patients who are um, eligible for transplantation, but uh, there are problems for patients not eligible for transplantation. Again, as bortezomib is generic, melphalan, prednisolone, bortezomib, and PV combination, no problem. I mean, sometimes oral melphalan is also a problem to get, because sometimes oral melphalan is not available on the market, at least in Hungary, it's not registered, so it's a little problem because it's off-label, melphalan. Melphalan's label comes from MPV, Valcade label. So, I mean, legally, it's borderline. Uh, so, but since the drug is cheap, then uh, although the price of melphalan has gone up approximately yes. three times in the last couple of years, uh, but it's still cheap, uh, so it's a problem is marginal at this point and we have access to MPT and CTD combinations who, for those patients who need uh, all oral therapy, so who do not want to get uh, subcutaneous injections of uh, bortezomib. Okay, with lenalidomide and dexamethasone first line, I think uh, in Hungary the insurance company said that it's hopeless, so to finance because they normally finance lenalidomide for four months and then you have to show partial response or better and then you get additional financing for one year and that's for relapse disease. But for uh, newly diagnosed elderly patients to give 18 months of therapy or maybe continuous, as Dr. Zwigman said, this seems to be, again, beyond financial control. So it is at least not covered by Hungarian insurance. But, you know, lenalidomide dexamethasone has been superseded, at least in the U.S., with bortezomib lenalidomide dexamethasone. It has been shown in a clinical trial 
that it is superior. Again, this is not label, although uh, botezomib would be cheap, but lenalidomide botezomib again goes to the expensive problem. So since it's off label, it's easy to refuse, and we have a financing problem again with lenalidomide first line. In those cases where we have uh, pre-existing neuropathy due to diabetes or alcoholism, uh, I mean, this is a problem, but uh, we have uh, generic bendamustine in Hungary and probably in your countries as well. And generic bendamustine is uh, on label and financed. So I think this is a good option at this point uh, for these patients who have neurotoxicity due to myeloma, diabetes, or alcoholism. Um, so I think the problems are here mostly related for, to first-line lenalidomide. Now, relapse. Okay, I would start uh, in the middle. But you as a physician or you as a uh, patient, you want the best available therapy on the insurance provider, wants you to get the cheapest therapy. And these usually do not coincide. That's a problem because uh, at least uh, in Hungary, insurance providers prefer repeat as many times a bortezomib-based therapy as possible because it's cheap and uh, effective usually, but toxic as far as uh, all of you know that bortezomib has a long-term problem of neurotoxicity, especially uh, hand and feet uh, sensory neuropathy. Now, if prior response was good and the side effects were few, then I have a smiley face. I have no problem medically to repeat it. I mean, there are these patients, maybe one third of the patients had few side effects and very good response, and I have no problem. Repeat MPV, repeat uh, BTD, no problem. Class switch would be required in those cases when you have a neuropathy or other toxicity and then the problem is that uh, the insurance company may want you to use thalidomide because again it's cheap, much cheaper than lenalidomide, but the problem is that thalidomide is toxic, especially its neurotoxicity tends to be long term and usually not very reversible. So it's a problem. And uh, in this case, you may get access to lenalidomide but usually the problem is that at least in Hungary, they give a quota to each department. And if your quota is filled, then uh, uh, you have to turn in individual claims. And then it becomes really difficult to get access to the drug. Second line. Third line is uh, usually easier because in the third line, the insurance company cannot really argue effectively against the use of lenalidomide. Unfortunately, we do know from clinical studies that lenalidomide works better in second line than in third line, but the insurance company thinks the opposite way, that uh, if you give it third line, it works less effectively, less effectively, that's better because they have to provide it for a shorter period of time. You see, I, I always say that they uh, sit on the horse and holding the tail. <laughs> so they want to delay uh, providing the best drug because uh, delay means fewer months of therapy and that's better for them for financing viewpoint. Okay, so triple combinations. You know, uh, if the patient is fit, then you want to use three drugs instead of two because three is better than two. Four may be not better than three, but in certain situations may be, but three is optimal. So if a patient is fit, you want to use. But two expensive drugs in one line of therapy, it's very difficult. Uh, again, uh, the insurance companies, uh, at least in developed countries, may want you to use the cheapest available therapy, not the best. Uh, and uh, at least the reality in Hungary is uh, that uh, you could use bortezomib in combination with steroid, prednisolone or dexamethasone, and a cheap cytostatic drug like cyclophosphamide, malphalan, or doxorubicid. So this is a triple therapy, effective and good, but the problem is bortezomib toxicity. Thalidomide containing regimens are again available, and uh, in this case they are off-label like CTD, uh, but usually 
in Hungary finance because the situation is interesting that uh, something is maybe off label but cheap then who cares about being off label something is off label and expensive then it becomes really important and it is off label and the new drugs carfilzomib, ixazomib and daratumumab usually to get access in second line is problematic but as we heard from Dr. Zygman it's also a problem in the Netherlands uh, whose per capita GDP is a couple of times higher than Hungary so the problem is really maybe universal at this point. So to get the best therapy may be without, uh, uh, not, not without any problems. Yeah, that's a problem. And uh, it's difficult to handle. And I think uh, patient advocacy groups are really important uh, to tailor this kind of problems, uh, uh, to show to the lawmakers that uh, best available therapy is the best option for the patient. Okay, salvage transplantation. So we, we are talking about transplantation done second or maybe third time because now there are data emerging that autologous transplantation can, could be done even three times, not just two. I mean, two is now standard of care, but now we start to talk about three. Now, so at least uh, in Hungary, patients who responded well uh, at least maybe minimum two, but better than three years for autologous transplantation. You can give uh, good induction therapy and then do a second autologous transplantation, and it is normally uh, uh, approved by the finance uh, transplantation committee, and it's done quite regularly, but not frequently. But the problem is availability of stem cells, because uh, there is not really universal capacity to collect stem cells sufficient for two or maybe three transplantation because it takes a lot of uh, financial resources to maintain these banks because these are kind of uh, cell banks because they uh, sooner or later they will cover buildings because there are so many patients and so many bags of uh, stem cells. So it's really problematic because of material and human resources because uh, they, you have to maintain them properly. There was a question about possibility of recollection and our result was 19 out of 20. So it is possible to recollect stem cells but Plerixa 4 access is critical. Without Plerixa 4 maybe only one third of these patients could be effectively immobilized. So it's very important uh, uh, that at, at least in Hungary, Plerixa 4 is available, so we have no problem with this. And the waiting list is a problem because uh, for second autologous transplantation, the waiting list is more of a problem than in the case of the first because uh, in these patients, uh, uh, you really want to have the transplantation done in the optimal period. Uh, otherwise, uh, the advantage of the second transplantation uh, may be lost because you need to give another uh, salvage therapy. And I think this is an interesting uh, situation that autologous stem cell transplantation in myeloma at present is one of the cheapest therapies available. I think this is only a couple of months of lenalidomide treatment or uh, maybe two months of daratumumab treatment. So it's really, really, I would say, dirt cheap <laughs> as compared to the novel drugs. And uh, this has been the totally opposite maybe 10 years ago. And uh, this is, uh, it made a very interesting situation because the transplant budget uh, should be increased uh, to cover all these additional necessary transplantations. And I think, uh, again, this needs to have the lawmakers and the financial decision makers to become aware of this problem, that we need to have more access to autologous transplantation, and on the long run, it saves money for the country, because this is a cheap therapy nowadays. And this is a specially expensive therapy, quote unquote, but in the case of myeloma, this is not true anymore. Okay, and how about the situation of refractory myeloma? Refractory myeloma are considered patients who do not respond to therapy or those who progress immediately upon stopping it. That, 
this means that patients may respond well to a therapy, but when you decide to terminate therapy, they immediately progress. That means a problem because they have probably a resistant clone that emerges during the therapy. And usually uh, you remedy it by class switch. So if the patient receives bortezomib-based therapy, then you switch to lenalidomide-based therapy uh, or maybe pomalidomide if available in your country. But lenalidomide refractory patients have a more difficulty because if they received first line bortezomib, second line lenalidomide, they may have pre-existing neuropathy from first line therapy. So you don't want, you cannot easily switch back to bortezomib. So you really want to give them something better, less toxic. But at least in Hungary, this is a situation where the insurance company says that, oh, we have non-neurotoxic alternative, bendamustine, which is very cheap, you should provide that. But the problem is that bendamustine uh, using uh, third, fourth, fifth line, it's uh, kind of palliative therapy. In my experience, bendamustine in this situation works as long as you provide it, and immediately the patient progresses when you stop them. But the insurance company says that, again, you can give six cycles, six months, and then we can renegotiate in six months. So, and uh, professionally, in this situation of lenalidomide refractory patient with neuropathy, I would like to give my patients carfilzomib or daratumumab, but it is a difficult application to get approval for. I don't know about your country, but we'll be happy to hear your experience. And there is a situation of multi-refractory myeloma. I mean, this is a real tough job. Patients uh, in this category do not respond uh, to multiple attempts. So I mean, you try this and that and that, and then the patient still progresses. And usually there are very few things that can turn bad uh, with a patient uh, who respond to therapy and a lot of things who can turn bad for the patient who is refractory to the therapy. Because you get all the toxicity of the therapy and then all the problems of progressive myeloma. So this patient's condition is usually deteriorating. You need to be quick. And uh, individual applications tend not to be quick. And especially if the patient exhausted the good options of bortezomib and lenalidomide-based combinations. And in this case, usually a multi-agent combination like PDT PACE is used in Hungary. And uh, sometimes we give them 50 milligram of IV melphalan, and that's also a good option in certain situations and can work for a couple of months and give you time enough uh, to negotiate with the insurance company uh, to get something better. Sometimes it gets approval, sometimes not. And uh, in these situations, access to novel agents in clinical studies is really important. And uh, we are really keen on enrolling uh, refractory patients to clinical trials because usually that's the only way to get access to novel therapies uh, quickly enough. Uh, maybe daratumumab is a good option, but the problem is that it works only one in four patients. So four patients you treat for three, in this situation it won't work, only one out of four you will get an effective therapy. And uh, we have seen the results of pomalidomide uh, that it works only 40%, but if you have POM cyclo, then it goes up to 50. So it's a really a uh, problem. And the barriers are numerous and in this situation. And really, this yeah, I consider a very much unmet need in Central Eastern Europe. But our problems are uh, our problems. Together with the patients, uh, we strive to jump above the barriers and hopefully solve the situation. And I'm ready for questions and discussion. Anyone has a question? Yes, I have a question. Yeah. Should be many questions. <laughs> because we are talking about barriers to access, and in this particular context, you have mentioned, I have seen that whatever therapeutical 
uh, treatments you administer are more or less valid for all countries within uh, Eastern Europe. You have mentioned that professionally it is preferable to use CARFI, ICSA, DARA, etc. But you said that access is problematic. Could you define that? Could you give us some details? What do you mean problematic? Is, uh, do, you have to, do you have to ask the companies to make donations for the patients? Do you have to ask your own uh, agency for medication? to consider a particular case, mm -hmm. and if that's the case, uh, who's having the final, uh, the final word, let's say, the doctor, because a doctor will have 10 problematic cases uh, and probably will, uh, will have to submit only a list of five. <laughs> I mean, what is the role of the doctor in this uh, circumstance? But please define what does it mean Problematic. Yes, Thank you. yes. I, I mean, I, I completely understand the problem and, um, and, and your question's problem as well. I mean, uh, the situation is that uh, uh, it is very difficult to get donations from pharmaceutical companies outside of uh, certainly existing uh, individual uh, named patient programs. that are few in between, but we had one for Ixazomib and one for Nivolumab. Uh, so they do exist, but few in between. I mean, in Western Europe, there are more. But uh, uh, the general access situation in Hungary is that uh, uh, you have to turn in an advanced claim request uh, individually. Each patient, one by one, not a list. You have to uh, argue with the insurance company in writing why do you think your patient should get this or that drug and why not the other? And if uh, your claim is accepted, then you will get a couple of months of uh, financing of that drug and then you have to turn in a second claim to show that it was effective and so on and so on. Usually normally it's done every three months, you have to write a claim. So uh, the financing... Yes, to, to, to our insurance, but who, who makes the final decision are the hidden experts of the insurance company uh, whose name is secret. So they won't tell you. Uh, so uh, the, the, the medical expert of the insurance company who may be a, a good hematologist or who may be a poor hematologist. I mean, it, it, it cannot be influenced and... Uh, Maybe he's a good hematologist, but he has given uh, the uh, command to kill all applications this year. Maybe discuss next year, but this year we have no money left, and then uh, they will refuse uh, your applications, or they may give you no response uh, for a couple of months. Uh, then comes January, and they may accept it if your patient is still alive. <laughs> I mean, normally, normally what I do is I uh, administer the best available therapy at the same time I turn in my claim for the best theoretically uh, available therapy. And then, uh, because usually these patients who have progressive resistant myeloma, they need to get some form of therapy. So I decide what to choose from the available and I make some decision, sometimes it's only palliative care, but sometimes some sort of a combination that what I said that sometimes we use VDT paste, sometimes we use high dose malfalan without stem cells. And uh, this way we may get a few months of time to do all the correspondence with the insurance because normally it takes one to two months. I mean, this is not fast and the patient may pass away during this period. So this, I mean, and, and of course, uh, 
there may exist a black market for certain drugs, but that's, that, that, that is part of the patient's uh, problem. I mean, uh, some patients do get drugs illegally. I mean, that, I mean, but I, I cannot officially talk about yeah, it. <laughs> but there does exist a black market. You were talking about uh, waiting lists for the patients, but what about a lack or a shortage of stem cell donors, as we in Holland uh, uh, meet? You need more uh, stem cell donors for allogeneic transplantation. Yes. Yes, I mean, this is a problem, but less of a problem, uh, at least uh, in European countries, the uh, Caucasian population usually have a really good chance to get uh, a proper donor. Uh, I think in Hungary we have a problem of uh, gypsies because they uh, do not normally have a, a donor available because uh, of the different ageally constitution. And I think the same situation about the Basque people here in France and uh, Spain because they have a different ageally composition than the rest of the uh, European population. But most uh, of the Caucasian people in Europe uh, tend to be similar. So maybe a one mismatch donor could be found for more than 80% if sibling is not available. But siblings are few, and fewer and fewer, unfortunately, because the families tend to shrink. I don't know, my father uh, was 11th child, and I was second child. So I mean, the, the families are, are decreasing uh, as generations are passing. And uh, I think in no Hungary, normally, uh, most families have only one child. I don't know, in your countries, but probably the trend is similar. So siblings are much fewer, but the, uh, usually the young people who are the university students, many of them apply to become stem cell donors. So, I mean, they constitute a large number of healthy individuals, and, uh, and uh, maybe 80% of the patients have chance to have a good donor. But definitely for certain subpopulations, it's a problem. But I see it less of a problem for the main population. I have an, also a question. The problem is, uh, according to me, uh, and lots of people, lawyers also, that uh, states or um, insurance companies living on a different pattern, living on a different level than uh, patients, because you told already that the best cure is triple uh, combination. It uh, needs lots of uh, money for free drugs, not only one. And it uh, makes the life longer, uh, three or four times. I uh, had the article uh, from Professor Hayek, who wrote that in uh, Switzerland, Austria, Netherlands, using this uh, triple combination, but not, uh, not before, now, they, uh, it's not uh, very hard to find people living uh, 20, 20 or 25 years with multiple myeloma. So it will cost really a lot. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the, the situation uh, from the viewpoint of the insurance providers is uh, a little bit more complicated than that because uh, they tend to calculate uh, quality adjusted uh, life year gain and how much money that costs. And then uh, let's say if your uh, therapy increases your life expectancy by one year and it costs uh, 50,000 euros, then they may decide that this could be financed, but if it costs 100,000 euros, they may decide that this will not be financed because uh, your country cannot afford it. And Even uh, the quality is perfect. I mean, the quality of life is perfect after this triple combination. Uh, sometimes not. I mean, some, some lots, usually yeah, okay. yes, but sometimes not. Yeah, I mean, uh, so, I mean, it's a difficult situation. It's a 
because I mean these drugs tend to be really expensive and uh, more than a human life yeah and, and like definitely less than human life I mean when I was a medical student the life expectancy for myeloma was one and a half year uh, and maybe five years with transplantation and now average is beyond eight years it's maybe 20 yeah. something years I practice good, medicine uh, so. news, good news for us bad news for insurance yeah uh, I would like to tell something more. And especially it's for this space, many of these patients have to provide also retirement funds and so on. I mean, uh, yeah. they, they cost a lot of money for the states. Uh, we have uh, the sentence, empowering myeloma advocacy across Europe. And uh, try to imagine that we were talking about the data. It's a novel medicine. You told that it's 25% of success when you use it yes. but uh, I don't if you know that for the producer of data the center central and uh, the, the old communist countries are all together are two percent of income two percent yes of of their global income yeah they don't issue, even yeah, know yeah. where is Hungary yeah, it, Poland, it's kind of, Romania, I, I was told it's kind of rounding the numbers. Two percent. Um, they will not give any donation because it's too small market. It's sad, but I, I, I was really shocked. They see countries uh, or they see group of countries where uh, the income is more than 10 percent. It's a normal in big corporation, normal thinking, a GE or, or Ford or something like that. 10% is a serious market. Below, no. Sad. Yeah, sad but true. So, empowering myeloma advocacy across Europe must uh, be created on the level of governments before the elections and all these kind of things because we cannot uh, really think that the donation is a uh, away yeah I think so I mean uh, it's and, and, and also uh, access to more clinical trials because if you enroll your patient in a clinical trial mm -hmm. or a patient is volunteering to participate then usually can have access to the new drugs for free free f for the patient and free for the government insurance so I mean this is really important mm -hmm. that uh, the government insurance companies should strive to develop more centers of excellence to have more clinical trial participation but also it's uh, not really understood because this should be part of the long-term thinking of the insurance providers to uh, motivate the system towards uh, clinical trials and maybe some more uh, country-based clinical trials should be there. It was so a I have one more question, please. But wait, have wait, I have to, I am, uh, yeah. I have a role of chairman. Uh, okay. Sorry, sorry, it's a, okay. Yeah. No. I, I speak as a retired person from a company and oh. I want to, 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 to give you some hints. Uh, I completely agree with you about clinical trials because uh, uh, this uh, gives the company some more, let's say, uh, easy way to, to give drugs. But, and I remember we discussed a lot with Viorica in the past, what, what the, the community and also the doctor community should do is to, to raise the level, sometimes in some countries, of the centers. Because yes. the clinical trials should follow very strict rule of quality, the so-called good clinical practice. And we faced, when I was working in Novartis, the, the fact that in some countries the level, the level is increasing because of ESMO, because of EHA, because of training. Uh, uh, but this is uh, one point, help as a community to have a center of excellence to do clinical trial. Second, donation. Do I, I, I said also yesterday, companies are not charities. 
Okay, so, and I speak from uh, a, a former company that, uh, for example, in CML, uh, uh, organize one of the most important donation uh, project for Glivec in all underdeveloped countries. So the, the uh, companies that are aware of that try to find a way, but it's very difficult to, to even, even legally, even if uh, a company, and I faced that because I was working as, as responsible for patient groups, uh, and I, I received the uh, request for, for donation. But even, even willing to do that, from the legal point of view, the fiscal point of view, sometimes it's really difficult, even if uh, a company would like to. So I want to, not to defend, <laughs> but I want to explain some situations. So it's not so easy. To, to do donation, even if you want. Make an example from, from Italy, where, where I live. Uh, if, you make, if a company make a donation, they should pay VAT on that. That is crazy, yeah. if you Same. want. Okay, Same so I wanted just to, to explain some, some situation from companies, and, and the, the, the companies try to, when it's possible, to do it, but it's not easy also, and again, if you start with a donation, then it thinks that companies should do donation. We are, companies are not charities. No. Okay. Yeah, I think your comments are much appreciated. Thank you. There is some rules to avoid VAT payment. In Italy, <laughs> not. In Italy, not. I can tell you. The last question. The last question. It is the last question. I know. Uh, Susanna, thank you very much for your input. The problem is that the main responsibility goes to the state, particularly when the patients are taxpayers or have been taxpayers for all their life. So the primary responsibility is the state and not the company, and I fully agree with you that they are, you know, not charity. Uh, one, uh, and I have not heard anything about cytogenetics. You know, one way to establish the treatment, the stages, and so on and so forth. My question is, again, and relates to the responsibility of the state. Does your uh, state um, have um, uh, uh, cytogenetic laboratories? I know that private laboratories exist as well as in Romania. But are there any places where Hungarian people can go to the cytogenetics no. Laboratories governed by the state. Thank Fortunately, you. yes. There are six good cyto cytogenetic state. laboratories. State. 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 So it's free for the patient. So this is organized, yes, for cytogenetics. But we have a problem with minimal residual disease monitoring. That's a problem. This is still ahead of us to solve it. But uh, cytogenetics, yes, it's, uh, it has been fortunately solved. So it's free for the patient. Okay, thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. I would like to tell that we finished in time. So it's a good success. <laughs>